Hello everyone. I have a lot of videos about creating various voltage converters and power supplies, but there aren't that many videos on the topic of their repair. And just the other day, I found one of my old 12 to 220 inverters in storage, which was once lent to someone for a few days and eventually returned to me in a non-working condition with the explanation, we didn't do anything, we just turned it on and it went bang. Yes, I have quite a few acquaintances like that who manage to break equipment for no apparent reason and then return it or sometimes don't even return it. You know, there's a category of people who should avoid electrical devices. These people can break electronics even from a distance. This might sound unscientific, but believe me, there are quite a few such people. Let's get to the point. Even back then, I realized that the inverter failed not just by chance, but due to reverse polarity. In other words, the person simply mixed up the polarity when connecting to the battery. If it weren't for the claim that the inverter exploded exactly at the moment of connection to the battery, I wouldn't have blamed reverse polarity. Although, to be fair, I should note that sometimes the inverter fails at startup even if the polarity is correct. It's a rare phenomenon, but possible. Often, many similar inverters have reverse polarity protection, but this particular model lacks that protection. Yes, there are only fuses inside, but they don't help. The inverter itself is simple, with a modified sine wave output. Such devices are inexpensive, and if the problem is serious or requires a lot of work, repair shops won't take on this device, because a new one costs less. Today we will repair it and take a detailed look at what it consists of and how it works. I would like to ask you to comment on this video and share it with your friends. This is a huge incentive for the author and helps the channel grow. Thank you all in advance. I have repeatedly mentioned that I am not a repairman or a professional in anything, just a self-taught enthusiast who has been involved in electronics all my conscious life. Let's return to our converter. So, it's a car inverter, 12 to 220 volts, 50 hertz with a modified sine wave output. Equipped with a bunch of protections such as short circuit protection, overheating protection, low and high input voltage protection, light and sound indication of protection activation, and output voltage stabilization. The inverter is claimed to be 2 kilowatts. Oh, those Chinese watts. After disassembly, we observe a single printed circuit board inside. And let's start by studying the schematic of an almost identical inverter, which I once completely copied. You can find the link to that very video in the description. The schematic consists of two parts. The primary converter, which is based on the PWMTL494 and converts 12 volts into high voltage, and the secondary, which converts DC to AC. The converter topology is push-pull. The first microchip controls a pair of MOSFET transistors, which drive the pulse transformer by switching alternately. In the secondary winding of the transformer, we get high voltage at a frequency of tens of kilohertz, which is rectified into DC by fast diodes and smoothed by a capacitor. In the gate circuits of the MOSFETs, there is a small driver on low power transistors, which are needed to turn off the power MOSFETs. When a high level appears on one of the PWM chip outputs, the signal passing through a diode turns on the transistor. In this case, the driver transistor is off because a high level is applied to its base and it has an NP structure. When the PWM chip switches the output, a low level appears on the previously mentioned pin. And here a little more in detail. If you look at the block diagram of the TL494 PWM, you can see that its output stage consists of two separate transistors with open collectors. In our case, these collectors are pulled up to the positive, and when the internal transistors are triggered, there will be a high level at the outputs of the chip. And when these transistors are off, it is logical to assume that the emitters of the transistors will be floating, and there will be nothing at the output. That is why there are resistors in the circuit that pull the emitters of the internal transistors to the power ground. In other words, the low level at the PWM output is formed precisely by these resistors. This low level goes to the base of the driver transistor, causing it to turn on and discharge the gate capacitance of the first transistor to the power ground, ensuring that this transistor is securely off by the time the lower transistor turns on. Then the output of the chip switches, the lower transistor activates and, so it continues in a cycle, each MOSFET transistor controls its own half-winding of the transformer. This part, 
with the power inverter is slightly different in our specific case. Instead of small transistors, a full-fledged emitter follower is installed, which ensures proper control of a large number of MOSFETs, relieving the PWM chip. The number of these MOSFETs is three pairs, and there are more transformers three units. Each pair of MOSFETs controls its own transformer. By this principle, the number of power switches and transformers can be increased as much as you want, creating inverters of any power. I think that's clear. Let's move on. The lower part of the circuit is needed to convert the high DC voltage, which we get at the output capacitor, into an AC voltage of 220 volts at 50 Hz. For this, we have a so-called H or M bridge on four high voltage MOSFET transistors, and it works as follows. In this case, the second PWM controller, which is needed to control the bridge, operates at a reduced frequency of about 100 Hz. Note that this time pins 9 and 10 of the PWM, which are the emitters of the internal transistors, are connected to ground. Therefore, when these transistors are activated, the output of the chip or the collectors of these transistors will have the ground potential. The collectors themselves are pulled up to the positive supply through resistors. That is, when the transistor is off, the resistors form a positive voltage on its collector. By that time, the high and already constant voltage has been applied to the H bridge. Suppose the specified output transistor of the PWM chip is open and its collector is at ground potential. Meanwhile, the other transistor is off and its collector is at a positive potential. The positive or high level from the collector of the first transistor will go to the upper MOSFET of the H bridge and the switch will open immediately. This same high level will open the upper NTN transistor. When it turns on, it will shunt the gate of the second bridge transistor to ground, and the second MOSFET will be securely closed. Meanwhile, the low level from the collector of the second internal PWM transistor will go to the lower MOSFET of the H bridge and it will be closed. The other small transistor is also closed. At the same time, through the specified circuit, the plus from the power source will go to the gate of the third bridge transistor, turning it on. During this period, the first and third MOSFETs of the bridge are open, and the inverter output is in this state. Then the PWM controller will switch the output, and the previously shown transistors will close. The second and fourth will open, causing a change in the polarity of the power at the output, and this happens 50 times per second. The inverter also has switching delay circuits, or dead time. In fact, these are short idle intervals between the main pulses. They are needed to provide additional time for the control units to close the transistors of one leg before the other is activated. Otherwise, there will be a countercurrent and the transistors will blow. I won't talk about the protection units and other things because they are designed differently in various inverters. What I explained earlier is almost always built on this principle in all similar inverters. You might argue that I gave such a lecture for a simple repair that takes at most an hour if handled by a skilled technician. But I originally planned this video to be educational. And since you're watching it, it means you're interested. So, no complaint. Our patients suffered significantly. The fuses and power transistors of the converter burned out, and possibly something else. In any case, we heat up the soldering iron and deolder the fuses and all six transistors of the inverter. By the way, a couple of them turned out to be working. Next, we take a laboratory power supply and set the output voltage to about 12 or 13 volts and limit the current to around 100 to 200 milliamps. We connect the minus of the lab power supply to the input minus of the inverter and the plus to the 12th pin of the TL494 PWM controller chip. You can connect to any PWM chip. Next, we take an oscilloscope. Yes, you shouldn't mess with pulse technology without it. Even a simple budget oscilloscope will do. We check for the presence of a PWM signal on the gates of the power MOSFETs that were previously desoldered. The plus probe goes to the gate, the minus to the source. A clear square wave with sharp edges should be observed on the gates of all MOSFETs. If we don't see a signal, we check the gate limiting resistors for any breaks. They are fine, but there's still no signal. Then we check the voltage on pin 14 relative to ground. This is the reference source pin of the PWM chip, and it should have 5 volts. As this voltage is absent, but the 12 volt power supply is reaching the chip, 
you can confidently replace the chip with a new one. My PWM controller is dead, so we're installing a new one. We see that it's back to normal. It's important for the signal to have an amplitude above 10 volts. If the voltage is low, it means something is overloading the PWM output or it's defective. In that case, we check the integrity of the components in the driver circuits. In our specific case, if my assumptions are correct and there was a reverse polarity, and so far everything suggests this, there should be no problems in the high voltage circuit. And most likely, the transistors of the H-bridge are intact, but the second PWM might have been damaged. It is checked in a similar manner. Once we are sure there are no anomalies, we can solder the inverter keys. You can use analogs that are close in characteristics to those that were factory installed. But I am forced to deviate from this principle, because I don't have the IRF1404 keys that were originally here. They are powerful, with a current of up to 200 amps, and most importantly, their RDSON is only 4 milliohms. I'll use the good old IRF3205. They do have twice the on-state resistance, 8 milliohms, but they will work. Overall, the inverter should be able to deliver up to 600 watts. Next, we solder the new fuses into their rightful places, and it would also be a good idea to check the power supply capacitors. Reverse polarity can easily destroy them. Then we apply power again, but this time to the inverter's power input. The current can be increased to half an amp. The startup was successful, the inverter started. We check the output with an oscilloscope and see our 220 volts in square, or rather rectangular pulses. The frequency is 50 hertz and everything seems to be in order. We lower the supply voltage and at just under 10 volts the low voltage protection will activate. Then we increase the voltage and ensure that the over voltage protection also works. By the way, this inverter is initially equipped with reverse polarity protection based on MOSFET transistors at the input and there are mounting spots for them on the board. But to reduce costs, the manufacturer decided not to install them. What a pity. In the previously shown circuit, there is similar protection. The negative from the battery goes to the circuit through a fully open MOSFET transistor. In this state, the resistance of the open channel of the switch is very low, and it practically does not heat up. In normal mode, when the polarity is correctly connected, a positive voltage is at the gate and it will be open. If the polarity is reversed, ground is on the gate and it will be closed. In this case, power will not be supplied to the circuit. We'll install proper transistors in the protection circuit, solder gate resistors of 1 kilo ohm each for them, and the protection is ready. Let's test the operation of this protection. As we can see, everything is working. All that's left is to assemble everything together and test the inverter under load. Regarding the power of this inverter, it's clear that the stated 2000 watts is greatly exaggerated. The actual power is about three times less. The load will be a powerful rheostat, and we will power the inverter from a lithium iron phosphate battery. The current clamp shows the current consumption from the battery. The first multimeter shows the voltage at the inverter's input. The second multimeter displays the output voltage, and the third shows the output current. All devices are true RMS class, and they can correctly work with a rectangular waveform. So, the measurement is accurate. The load power is about half a kilowatt. And with that, this video is coming to an end. A detailed video with the assembly of different types of inverters and a description of their working principles is available on my two other channels, links to which you will find in the description. As always, this was Kazinov Ka, and see you next time. Goodbye.